Okay, I'm going to show you how the media cages your mind. Um, and the way that they put things when they make headlines to make you emotional and to lie. Now, New York Post has, since this, since I started this, corrected and made a different headline with the appropriate wording. It doesn't matter, though, because they already do the damage with the first one. They're trying to cage your brain. I found an article written by this man, Charlie Beckett. It is a perfect, perfectly written example of how the, the media is now turning emotions into a weaponizing, divisive um, propaganda machine against society and how it's trying to make us all crazy rather than make us all informed. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to look at this. Now look, this is, look, New York City bodega worker arrested for allegedly stabbing man to death over a bag of chips. That was the original story and how the New York Times worded this. Making it sound as if the, the, care, the caretaker of the store, the store clerk, was just bent on hurting somebody over a bag of potato chips. That is not how this occurred. The man that actually came in that passed away was this man, Austin Simon, 35, almost 36 years old, um, paroled from the New York State Department of Corrections on community supervision, currently on parole. He has quite the history. Um, he had been in, um, he was booked in November 17th of 2020 and had been in for a while and was released on parole supervision. So he was still actively on parole supervision and he was being paroled, um, supervised out of the Bronx five parole office at 26 Bruckner Boulevard, Bronx, New York, 10454. In case you want to write them and let them know that you're not happy um, about them paroling certain people and certain people being super aggressive in the community. Write the parole board. The parole board needs to hear voices from people in this nation that say, hey, you know something? Be more careful. This guy had a rap sheet a mile long. This guy was violent and he should have been much better supervised and he possibly should have been even on curfew or even GPS considering the amount of violence he has in his history which I believe is like eight or more convictions. So now let's talk about this article. This man did this great article and it's talking about, um, or this is the New York Post article talking about the violent fight stemmed from an earlier argument. Look, the earlier argument was that the woman, the girlfriend, came into the store, wanted to buy a bag of chips, did not have enough money on her EBT debit card, and pulled a knife on the store clerk. And when the store clerk did not respond and give her the chips, she went outside and went and got her boyfriend, who then came in to rough up the clerk over a bag of potato chips. I cannot stress to humanity enough how absolutely, absolutely deplorable you are to think that you have any right to harm somebody over a bag of potato chips. And then the New York Times to go and act as though the man was, the man at the store was the instigator. No, it was the girlfriend and the Simon man. She summoned Mr. Simon uh, to go in and take care of it. And, and what and it was a verbal spat. No, it wasn't New York Post. Yes, that's they they wrote that headline the first time. The New York Post wrote that as the first headline. Just oh, that that's it's an emotional hostage taking for people reading this. They're trying to have you feel emotional attachment toward violence. They want you to feel for the criminal and not for the victim. They're trying to change the way that we view crime. Why? Because the DA in New York wants to do crime his own way. Um, the EMS took Simon to Harlem Hospital where he later succumbed to his energy, uh, injuries. But you know something? It was a bag of stinking potato chips. Now, there, there are three factors currently driving journalists toward using emotion. The first is the economy. Competition. They've got to create those headlines that really draw people in. The second is about technology. It says, we have clear evidence that using emotional cues helps to get your attention and to prolong your engagement. 
So they're trying to create transmissions that are emotionally manipulative to where you feel something. So you purchase that because you feel something, not because you need to be informed. Third, it's about better understanding of behavioral science and even neurology. We know that politics and people, they respond emotionally to that. They don't respond emotional to ideas or facts. So when we do political journalism, we now talk about optics instead of facts. Marketing journalism is no different. They're focusing on emotions instead of facts because they're focused on marketing and they're not focused on actual facts. It says, um, our physical relationship to news is changing because of this technology. So basically, Rodin's thinker has become Steve Jobs' swiper. Humanity has become so fixated on instant gratification. They don't care if it's right or wrong. Just instant gratification. And if the words hit them, that's great. They'll run with them. They don't care. So why do we share news content? Well, to bring valuable and entertaining content to others. To get the word out about causes or issues they believe in. Or to divine ourselves to others. Um, in, in an emotional act. This is from Allison Rocky at Vox.com. This is why we share news content. But um, what about the journalists that share news content? Oh, yeah. Uh, what does all this emotionally driven sharing and liking lead to? In a sense, this is a familiar debate within the profession. They have created a new way of thinking about a news story, a news, a new, a new cycle of informative regurgitation. So the daily cycle of the newsroom sensitivity is, oh, an emotional event. You have interest, shock, and compassion. Then you do an editorial process where you're objective, organized, and formulaic, and you understand your personal feelings, guilt, pride, reflection, action. Those are what you normally identify as and you look at and you try to make sure that you separate the three and when you do a, a particle you do just nothing but factual information but this is the new cycle so there's an, an event there's a professional process there's an effective narrative what's going to get the most purchases there's an emotional audience response which goes to an emotion driven sharing which spikes their popularity, spikes their sales, spikes their clicks, and it gets them more, more, more subs, more money. That's what they're doing. The value of objective journalism is the idea that journalism can attempt to give the account that is balanced, fact-based, and that gives a fair summary not just of what has happened, but the context around it without the distortion of the journalist's own feelings. That's what journalism should do. But it doesn't do that. It should do this, but it doesn't do that. So he says, yet we seem to be witnessing the potential death of that kind of objectivity or the aspiration towards the unreachable ideal that has so conditioned much of what we think of as news reporting. This man hit it on the head. He goes on to say, but here's one of the dangers the filter bubble, the echo chamber, chamber, the danger that we end up only responding to emotional triggers that please us, that we only want to hear views that support, oh my stupid, stupid phone's messing up, that we only want to hear views that support our own views and confirm our prejudices. And he's right, we've created an echo chamber to where we only want to look for and get news that supports us. The better we get at modeling the user preferences, the more accurately we, accurately we construct recommendation engines that fully capture user attention. In a way, we are building personalized propaganda engines that feed us content, which makes users feel good and throws away the uncomfortable bits. And uh, that was from a data scientist Gilad Lotin, and he's right on the money. So what about the science? Well, we need to know more about it because we need to know the ontology of the data, the political economy of the identity when privacy goes public. We need to know the, the socio, socio, sociology of influence when power is redistributed emotionally. We're seeing a change, but we're seeing a change where people that used to think 
people that used to look at data, reflect upon it, take it apart, look at it objectively. They don't do that anymore. They don't think about things anymore. They don't sit down and say, how does this affect my life? Have I actually seen this? Do I actually participate in this? Or is this something that I don't see that I'm being pushed down my throat that perhaps is not as viable? What they're doing now is just saying, oh, let's spike it up, give them emotion, give them what they want, give them rage, give them purpose in their rage, in their emotional tirades, and they'll just want more and more and more. It really does hit the same spots in the brain as addiction. It is what I call emotional hostage taking. It bends people to your will. Journalist, stop this crap.